This is Billy Kay, welcoming you to the Scots Tongue, a celebration of the history of the language first broadcast in 1986 and featuring my own native ear to Ayrshire and the legacy of one of the Leeds' greatest and most influential screevers, Rabbi Burns. Our whiles one up male being both prude and affronted by Scots at the same time comes down to us for the 18th century. And this revelled cultural and linguistic duality is well depicted in the 20th century marker Louis Grasset Gibbon's vive description of his fellow countrymen and women that gives us the title of Programme 5 Split Tongued Surox. <laughs> He still spoke the school's idea of proper English. He knew that all right, because every time he opened his mouth, he could hear himself sounding like a real wee pan loaf toff. He remembered Nicol, the English teacher, saying that broad Scots was pronounced very much like Anglo-Saxon or Middle English or some such expression. If that was so, why did they try and bell you into speaking like some English Nancy boy in the wireless? He'd asked Nicol that. And Nicol said right or wrong didn't come into it. Proper English was what the school had to teach you if you weren't going to be a gutter snipe all your life. Was it being a gutter snipe to talk your own country's language? It would be a lot healthier if folk spoke one way. Sometimes you hear them say eight and sometimes eight. Sometimes farm and sometimes firm. Sometimes ye and sometimes yous and sometimes yes and sometimes you. Sometimes half and sometimes half. Was it your father or your father, your mother or your mother. You see, if school was any use, it would teach you things like that. No just jump on you for not talking like a Kelvinside Nancy boy. Why teach kids that Burns was the great national poet and then tell you his old Scots words were dead common? A passage from Gordon Williams' novel from scenes like these set in Ayrshire in recent times. It sums up the split mind that most Scots have about language, the result of the balancing act between the Scottish and English sides of the culture we inherit. And if it's still a lively debate now, it was even livelier back in the 18th century, when the divisions produced schizophrenic consequences among our leading intellectuals. Robert Burns was a product of that environment. His social betters advised him to desert Scots and write only in lofty Augustan English. Henry Mackenzie's review of the Kilmarnock edition of Burns's poetry got it completely wrong for posterity, but right for the fashion of the age when he wrote, One bar indeed his birth and education have opposed to his fame, the language in which most of his poems are written. Burns did comply a little with some forgettable poems in English like Edina, Scotia's Darling Seat, but fortunately he was enough of his own man to realise the power of his writing in Scots. But where stands the language of Burns in Ayrshire the day? Wally Morrison and Jimmy Dunnachy are for the Irvin Valley. They don't teach them Scots in the schools at all anyway. It's mm-hmm. all English. Mm-hmm. English history. Mm-hmm. Nae Scots. And it's for Scots words. They can mere about Dallas and Dynasty. But the Scots, like it's a Fran or Shuch or a... Only Scots word that we can uh, They haven't got a clue. I feel myself that it uh, could easily disappear, that the bairns of the present day will definitely not have the knowledge of the lowland tongue that some of us here and our ancestors definitely did aye, have. Aye. That it'll just be like uh, choirs and specialists and that that will really can oh to about the old words and what they mean. Language changes from generation to generation, but I think we've been conditioned ever since Burns' day to think that Scots is dying. Often teenagers in my home area the day still use the dialect as their main means of communication, and words like dicht, signed, bringe, creasy, bra and lassie will always come more naturally than the English equivalent, if an equivalent exists. In some schools too, the dialect is tolerated, whereas a four it was banned except at recitation time when the Bard's birthday was celebrated and the Burns Federation was honing out the prizes. Scottish literature is also more widely taught, but it's rarely related to the language the Wains bring to the skill. Accepting the use of Scots in poetry, but despising its spoken form, goes back to the 18th century as well. 
John Pinkerton's introduction to his anthology of ancient Scottish poems in 1786. None can more sincerely wish a total extinction of the Scottish colloquial dialect than I do, for there are few modern Scotticisms which are not barbarisms. Yet, I believe, no man of either kingdom would wish an extinction of the Scottish dialect in poetry. If you thought attitudes like that were a thing of the past, you'd be mistaken. A memo from a Scottish headmaster to members of his teaching staff dated March 1985 reads, Five of our former pupils have lost their places in offices under a youth training scheme because they either could not or would not attempt to speak standard English on the phone. If you allow the use of the Doric by your pupils in your room, you could be a contributor to what can only be described as a sorry state of affairs. A sorry state of affairs indeed when the language of Burns is seen as a social and professional handicap. But from our enlightened century back to the 18th century, even then people who valued Scots feared the threat posed by English and tended to look nostalgically to the golden age of pre-Union Scottish culture. But it wasn't to the sophisticated culture of the King's Court in the early 16th century that they looked. The fashion in the 18th century was to praise the rustic and primitive. Robert Ferguson's elegy on the death of Scots music follows this tradition. On Scotia's plains in days of yore, when lads and lassies tartan wore, Saft music rang on Ilka shore and Hamley weed, but harmony is now no more, and music's deed. When the saft vernal breezes call the grey-haired winter's fogs a war, nobody then is heard to blow on your hill or mead, on chanter or an eaten straw, since music's deed. Nae lassies knew on summer days will lilt at bleach and other clays. Nay herds and yarrows bonny breeze or banks o' tweed delight to chant their Himalays since music's deed. At Gloman knew the bagpipes dumb, when weary owls and hame would come, say sweetly as it wont to bum and peabrook screed, whenever hear its warlike hum for music's deed. Behold the hills and dales are Round with lowing flocks and herds abound, the wanton kids and frisking lambs gamble and dance about their dams. The busy bee we humming noise and. Ferguson's favourite song, The Birks of Invermay. Ferguson also wrote poetry of city life with gutsy realism and could reject the anglicisation sweeping Edinburgh better than most. His was the age of James Beattie's list of Scotticisms to be avoided, as Scots on the make flocked to London and attempted to integrate and in some cases ingratiate themselves with upper-class English society. Even those who stayed at home felt the need to improve themselves in English. Now, in those days before mass communications, few Scots ever heard an English voice, so the acquisition of a polite English accent posed considerable problems. Editor of the Dictionary of the Older Scottish Tongue, Jack Aitken. They also lacked self-confidence in their written English, which, by the middle of the 18th century, they had no need to do, because it really is excellent English. But in fact, they, they combed one another's writings, you, you know, you got friends along to, to look for Scotticisms and in order to weed them out. And you remember, of course, that they, they always felt that um, they wrote English, as they said, as a dead language. That's because they didn't have a natural speaking background. Mm -hmm. They wrote um, it like foreigners almost. We, uh, well, I quote, uh, I think this is James Beatty, but there are lots and lots of statements like this. We who live in Scotland uh, write English as a dead language which we understand but cannot speak. Ah, here we are, I think, Doctor. Yes, you are sitting among the skulls addressing death. You say, 
Thy bony hand lies chill upon my breast. Now add my carcass to thy loathsome feast. Breast, no breast. I know it has to be read breast before it rhymes, but an Englishman says breast. B-R-E-A-S-T. Yes. Breast. No, no, breast. An Englishman says breast for B-R-E-A-S-T. Yes. Doctor, have you ever been to England? No. I thought so. English as a spoken language is completely foreign to you. But I read nothing else. No, I said as a spoken language. You cannot possibly know how English words should sound. You have no right to write English poetry. Nay, no right. Is that what they say in London? Englishmen say that, yes. Oh, dear me. A lot of my rhymes are wrong, then. A considerable number. Oh, dear me. A scene from Robert McClellan's play The Fleurs of Edinburgh, which punctures the pretensions of 18th century Anglophiles. Many language and elocution teachers during this period made a lot of money out of the Scots' pretensions. But in the 18th century, it was as necessary for that section of society to speak what they thought was refined English as it is for Scots youngsters today to sing rock music with American accents. But the fashion became ingrained in the Scottish psyche, and for the next two centuries, teachers and ministers tried to eradicate the native idiom from the speech of ordinary people. They were only partly successful, but the result is that two centuries later, it's not English, but Scots, which is foreign to many of our compatriots. The other night there I was talking to a chap and uh, he asked me what a paddle was because he was quite interested in Burns' poetry and that. So, well, a paddle is a spade-like thing we use for clearing the rest of the pioch. Mm-hmm. And he stood and he looked at me, more or less kind of glowered, so he well, would you please explain because I don't know. So I tell them that the rest was what the English call the mould board of a plough, and a pioch's a plough. Yet in most working class communities of our Scotland, Scots is still the predominant language. Another myth about Scots is that it's only spoken in the country, but my ain't tune, Gosson, had its pits at ye time and factories the day, and Scots is what the folk talk there. Jimmy Dunnocky is for a fairman whack run, Willie Morrison for the miners Ross. We gave your neighbours about horn, you can at harvest time and that. If ye buddy had his, his corn in, he, he just gave and gave his neighbour a horn, you can. Mm-hmm. Ilk a buddy worked that way, you can. That mm-hmm. uh, you just sort of worked a horn and helped each other out that way. It's the only way you could manage through. I mind my father telling me that uh, the miners and the country folk, they were like two different breeds of, of men. In the old days, what would you say to that? Well, I I think uh, as far as the big farmer and the miner was concerned, there was a big divide. But in a wee place like where that was broke up, well, before my time in the 26th strike, my late grandfather helped to keep quite a few miners' families gone in tatties and all that kind of thing to help them through. Mm-hmm. Because... He, being in a wee way, had far more sympathy with the miners that were out in strike and their families than what, say, the, the great big farmer would he. Where I was brought up eh, was John Street in Goston, and it was more or less a miner's row. The buddy next door to us was, was Maggie, and across the road was Mary. And in these days, they ordered a ton of coal. Well, it wasn't just a ton of coal, it was a kirta coal, and it cost 10 shillings. You ordered it one day and it was dumped at your door the next day. You could depend on it. But whoever, for some unkent reason, Mary's coal didn't arrive. Now, in these days, it was the, the way of the miners, when they were uh, going to bed at night, the fire was gay low, but what they put on was a great big lump of coal called a raker. Well, as I say, Mary's coal hadn't come and she hadn't had to put in the fire that night. So she came out to Maggie and she says, I wonder if I can borrow a raker of coal for you, Maggie, till my coal comes in one's morning. So Maggie says, I'll give you a raker of coal, Mary. So Mary gets a raker of coal and out she went, put it in the fire 
and I walked to bed. That's what they did. The raker was the last thing that went on before they went to their bed. So Mira rises the next morning and uh, here was the raker. It hadn't kenneled. So she just lifted it out of the fire and went across the street to Maggie and she chapped at the door. She says, that's your raker back, Maggie, she says, and it's nain the war. <laughs> 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 so was you but broke so, up in, in a minor's row? What was oh, the line? Like? What were the like, the minor suicide? Oh, well, it was just a... Uh, a button bin, as they would call it. Well, we had a, a, what you'd say, knew the living room, and there was only one bedroom. And there was five of us broke up in that, along with my mother and father, and uh, even my granny. I don't know who they got my granny in, but she stayed there and all. And who was slept? Of course, we had what some folk would call a hurley, but we called it a whirly. And that was a bed with, below the, the built-in beds. There were just, it was two beds in the wall in the kitchen and the whirly was in below the bed. If you had a bigger family, you needed this. And it was put out onto the middle of the flare at night. Mm -hmm. And the Waynes slept in that. The mother and father slept in the, in the rich bed in the hole in the wall. When I was being brought up in Goston in the 50s, the two main cultural influences was Rabbi Burns and Elvis Presley. And I can still quote freely for Beth. Burns was alive and popular because his songs were sung at family get-togethers. Kenning your Burns was natural in Ayrshire, but it could lend you a horn in other ears as well, as Wally Morrison found out when he got to the English customs after a holiday in Switzerland. All the English folk were saying, I joke, when you go through the customs, you'll get caught. It'll cost you a penny or two. And when we went up to the customs man, he says, eh, have you anything to declare? I says, only thing that's dutiable say, is in that bag. He says, how many cigars, he says, are in that box? And he took out his pen knife just at this minute and he started to open the box because there was a wee sprig hood in the lid down. And he prized open the box. I says, I think there's 14 in it, but I'm no sure. However, he just had a wee bit luck at it. And he looked at this leather bag. He says, where did you get the bag? I says, eh, we booked it in Scotland. He says, what part of Scotland do you come from? I says, oh, we come from Ayrshire. He says, are dressing? I says, no. So I inland. He says, Mochland. He says, I says, no, say Goston. He says, the rising sun o'er Goston mares. And before he could say another word, I says, with glorious licht was glinting, the hairs were hurtling down the furs, the laverets they were chanting. And he took out chalk and put three wee crosses and said, foo sweet that day. <laughs> and that was that. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we got onto the coach, when we were going back into London, I went up that passage and I says, I was shake my knees, says I. You've got a Shakespeare side, but you haven't got a Burns that can get you through the customs. <laughs> For them that doesn't get Burns off be heard, what poem was I? Was hey, that's the to? step to the Holy Fair. Aye. Aye, that's, it's only part of the first verse. Uh -huh. Because it starts a wall upon a summer Sunday morn when nature's face is fair. I walked forth to view the corn and snuff the colour here. The rising sun o'er ghost and mares with glorious licht was glinting. The hairs were harpling down the furs. The lavrocks they were chanting. Too sweet that day. And what is it going to describe that poem? Oh, it's about the lasses going to the... It's actually going to Mockland, to the Holy Fair. See, this would be them setting out for Goston, as they would set out for Kilmarnock and all that, Black Garden for Kilmarnock and all, and they were all co uh, congregated at the, the communion at, at Mockland Green. Here, farmers gash in riding grace, gade hodden by their cotters. There, swankies young in braw braid claith are springing o'er the gutters. The lasses, scalping barefoot, thrang in silks and scarlets glitter, with sweet milk cheese and money a whang, and farrels baked with butter, foo crump that day. When by the plate we set our nose, we'll heaped up we happens, a greedy glower black bonnet throws, and we mun draw our tuppence. Then in we go to see the show, on every side they're gathering, some carrying dales, some chairs and stools, and some are busy blethering recht loud that day. Here stands a shed to fend the shores and screen or country gentry. There racer Jess and twa three whores are blinking at the entry. Here sits a raw wot tittle and jades with heaving breasts and bare neck, and there are batch of wabster lads, black garden frae Kilmarnock, for fun this day. There was a lad with born and child, who 
but what the day hand for the style I did it hardly worth her while to be seen I stay Robin Robin was a roving boy Rant and roving, rant and roving Robin was a roving boy Rant and roving, Robin Monarchs hind most year to ten was five and twenty days begun. Was then a blast the Janbar wind, blue Hansel and on Robin. Robin was a roving boy, rant and roving, rant and roving. Robin was a roving boy, rant and Robin. The gossip kicked in his loof, for she who lives shall see the proof. This wheelie boy will be Nick Hoof, I think we'll call him Robin. Robin was a Robin boy. Rant and roving, rant and roving, Robin was a roving boy, rant and roving, Robin. In the 19th century, attitudes to Scots softened a wee bit, possibly due to the success and prestige gained by Burns all over Europe. Also, the Romantic movement had established a fondness for past ways of life and ancient languages and culture with a purity untainted by the new industrial age. The success of Sir Walter Scott's historical novels made nostalgia for the Scottish past respectable, and few writers used Scott's speech to such brilliant effect. This is Jeanie Deans pleading with Queen Caroline for her sister's life to be spared in the novel The Heart of Midlothian. Oh, madam. If ever ye kenned what it was to sorrow for and we a sinning and a suffering creature, whose mind is so tossed that she can be neither called fit to live or die, he some compassion on our misery. Save an honest who's free dishonour and an unhappy girl no eighteen years of age free an early and dreadful death. Alas, it is no when we sleep saft and walk merrily ourselves that we think on other people's suffering. Our hearts are waxed licht within us then, and we are for richting our own rangs and fechting our own battles. But when the ouro trouble comes to the mind or to the body, and seldom may it visit your ladyship, and when the ouro death comes that comes to high and low, long may it be yours. Oh, my lady, then it isn't what we hae done for ourselves, but what we hae done for others that we think on most pleasantly. And the thought that ye hae intervened to spare the poor thing's life will be sweeter in that hour, come when it may, than if a word o' your mouth could hang the hail porches mo but the tail o' ye tow. Convinced that Scots was dying, the establishment could safely regret its passing. As today, it's never contemporary speech that's valued. It's invariably classed as coarse, but in Aubrey's granny's day, oh, Scots was pure and worth preserving. The novelist Henry Mackenzie had regarded Burns's use of Scots as unfortunate, but in his old age he could look back with nostalgia. There was a pure classical Scots, spoke by genteel people, which I thought very agreeable. It had nothing of the coarseness of the vulgar patois of the lower orders of the people. The Scots speech of the past is now regarded as acceptable, just so long as you don't find it on your own doorstep. Many educationalists say they support Scots, but not the gutter patois of their own locality. This happens from Buchan to the borders, and is a convenient way of refusing to cope with the home language of the pupils. The daft thing is that Scots is so like English that there's no excuse for not learning it. It isn't like Gaelic, where those who lose it have to relearn a whole new language. Scots and English share so much that Scots is easy to learn, but it's different enough in feel to give access to a radically different world picture and a dynamic literary tradition. 
And not everyone who speaks Scots had it as their mother tongue. Gavin Sprott works in the Royal Museum's Country Life section. I come from Dundee. Um, Dundee comes South Angus, you might say. Were you brought up speaking standard English as your first language? In my family, yes. Although within my family there was a... I suppose there was an understanding of Scots. Also, my father spoke Gaelic. He was fluent in the, uh, the Appen Gaelic. Was your, was your father, he was a, a bishop at the Episcopalian Church? That's that? right, he was the Bishop of Brechin. I ken that in that language there's another one, you're bilingual in Scots. When did you start to get an interest in Angus Scots and who did you come to speak it then? Well, that's awful difficult to say, really. I can't exactly mind the date that you could put on that. But you was I surrounded with. It was just there, if you like. I mean, folk just spoke it about the place, about the house, folk that come to help in the house and that. And of course, so far as I'm concerned, I use it in my work quite a lot. Where main outlet, I suppose, being the being the Ag- agricultural museum at Ingleston. Um, you go out in field work, you have to deal with folk that's... Um, you could almost say they're monoglot speakers in Scotch. One of the biggest influences on the different dialects of Scots today, apart from the English of the media, is the speech of the big cities. Next week, I'll look at urban Scots, possibly the best yardstick to gauge the way Scottish speech will go in the future. As to the present, them that his Scots are guys sure they want to hang on to it. They're no in a moger or a muddle as far as that's concerned. I think we should try to keep it all, all going because there's some of the most descriptive words in Scotch that should never do at all. We should just keep uh, trying to educate folk and trying to bring them in. Just for instance, there I was speaking to a fellow on Saturday and I was used the word moger and he just stared. He just hadn't a clue what I was talking about and I had to explain it. So by explaining these kind of things to folk, it's the only way we're going to keep uh, a lot of these old words gone. You can see whilst folk think it's it's a bit odd because they're not used to it. And I suppose you can forgive them that, but folk get the guy they get themselves in a half a revel about speaking in a certain way, but folk just accept the way you speak. If you just did, if it's yourself, and you just did with confidence, and that's that's you, that's your identity. Folk will accept it. <laughs>